focus for their children, young people to listen to. Do you love me? Uh, those words have no doubt been asked thousands of times by various people, sometimes with pure motives, but sometimes perhaps asked deviously to get what they want. If you truly love me, you'll do this for me. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you truly love me? was a question Jesus asked. And it reminds us that being a Christian and following Jesus isn't about keeping rules. Not simply about rules, but rather about being in an ongoing relationship with Jesus. And if there are rules, there are rules which promote that relationship. Let's get that straight. And like every serious relationship, it's a bond of love, of commitment and sacrifice. Uh, you might have heard of this story before, but um, uh, soon after I started at Liverpool Street Station as a railway chaplain, uh, back in 2009, um, this young fella, um, he said to me, I'd like to have your job. Uh, and I said, okay then, um, you have to become a Christian first. And he said, well, I think I'm a Christian. I'd known him a few weeks at this point, and, and I said, are you married? I knew full well he was married. I even knew the day he got married. And, and he said, yes, he said, of, course I'm, you know, of course I'm married. You know that I'm married. And I said, it's just the same. It's just the same when you're a Christian. You know that you're a Christian. And I said, in the same way as there was that time where you committed yourself to your wife, and your wife said, I do, and committed herself to you. With every Christian, there has to be a time where you commit yourself to the Lord Jesus, and you know that it's not, I think I'm a Christian, but I know I'm a Christian. That your life is united to his now. And it is very much a bond of love, commitment and sacrifice. Well, let's look at this chapter before us, John 21. I'd like you to imagine the scene. Jesus, very recently risen from the dead, is on the beach. And he's cooking freshly caught fish. And he's there with seven of his disciples. And he turns to Peter and he says, in effect, Simon, son of John, do you still love me more than these disciples do? Do you love me more than these? You see, Jesus knows full well what he said. What did he say? Well, it's in Mark 14 and uh, verse 27 to 31, if you're taking notes. And this is what happened. You will all fall away, Jesus told his disciples, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But Jesus continues, after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight, before the cock crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. And Peter is acutely aware of how he denied the Lord. Everything was carried out to the letter of Jesus' prophecy. But he turns to Peter and says, do you still love me more than these? Jesus, very painfully for Peter, he's making reference to Peter's boasts. And notice that Jesus doesn't use the name he gave him originally. He says, Simon, son of John, do you still love me? And Jesus is showing to Peter what happens when Peter 
or any of us when we operate and trust in our own strength and not on the Lord Jesus. And we cannot do God's work with human strength. And Peter answers, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, what can Peter do? You know, he can't jump in with both feet, as it were, not after he's made such a mess of things before Jesus was crucified. And Jesus tells him, in reply, you can see that there in verse 15, Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said to him, a second time, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And he answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And this time, Jesus tells him to take care of my sheep. And the third time Jesus asked that question, the horror of that evening where Peter denies knowing Jesus, it must sweep over him. There's no mention of Jesus scolding Peter as such. He's doing it in a, a gentle way, but it's hard hitting all the same. Because he asks him three times, do you love me? And of course, everybody knows full well that Peter denied the Lord Jesus three times. Peter knows what Jesus is getting at, and it's very humbling. It's very painful, but it's also very necessary. When we get things wrong, God still loves us. But our sin spoils our relationship with him. We need to know how bad we are before God forgives and God restores. We really need to feel the pain of our failure before we feel the joy of God's forgiveness. We need to face up to our specific sins and confess them to God before God can really use our lives in his service. And it could be that you've never felt forgiven by God because you've never really repented of your sins. Think of it like this. You know, sometimes you might see a poster or something that just says, Jesus saves. And you could be glib and think, well, you know, is he, you know, saving with a particular bank or building society? Um, is he almost like a goalkeeper, you know, saving goals? It's all a bit up in the air. and It's not really pen, peg, pegged down. You don't really understand it. And so you need context. You need the whole story. And of course, the Bible tells us that we're sinners and that we're locked out of heaven and out of God's favour until we come face to face with our sin. And not just somebody else's sin. We know we can listen to the news, read it. We know the sin in the world all the time. But we'd always say that's other people. We'd always say that's not our problem. Whereas now, we need to repent. We need to come face to face with our sin. And that's why the message Jesus saves impacts your life and mine. Because he is the saviour. And we need to understand there's no such thing as cheap forgiveness. Because true forgiveness always costs. And all our sin is ultimately against God. You know, you might have wronged your neighbour, your partner, family member, whoever it might be, a colleague. But all our sin is ultimately against God. And it costs Jesus complete rejection by people that he had made. It cost Jesus his heart betrayed and denied by two of his closest followers and indeed abandoned at his critical hour. It cost Jesus his very life, killed by the Romans, but in doing so, 
they played a part in fulfilling God's plan to restore mankind to himself. And we really have no right to say, as some do, God will forgive me, that's just his job. Because we deserve his punishment and our rebellion. After all, I've never, I've never met anyone who's been wronged and then believes that the lawbreaker should just be let off. Mr. Jones, we find you guilty of the crime, but because you said you're very sorry, and because you said you won't do it again, we trust that you'll be good from now on. You are free to go. It doesn't happen, does it? That's not justice either. We wouldn't be satisfied with that. We can expect the judge to punish Mr. Jones for the crime and not to let him off. And why should it be any different when it comes to you and me and the breaking of God's laws? And that's why Jesus painstakingly takes Peter through this process of realisation of the wrong that he's done of repentance, and that's a, a turning away from the wrong he's done and turning to God and the right path. This process of reconciliation to the Lord whom he loves and actual restoration to a place of trust and greater responsibility. And when Jesus tells Peter, feed my lamb, Take care of my sheep and feed my sheep. Jesus is telling Peter to, to look after the Christians in the church. And Jesus has said that he is the good shepherd in what 11 chapters earlier. I am the good shepherd. He's not like the ones who lead astray, who, who take them down a dangerous path. We don't know any better themselves. No, he's the good shepherd. But the good shepherd now is appointing an under-shepherd to take care of the sheep. And he's appointing Peter. Peter, don't you find that amazing? Peter, who's messed up big time. Uh, wouldn't you expect Jesus to say, John, you can take the shepherd role now in the church? After all, although John ran away at first, he came back and he was there at the cross. And you expect him to say, John, you can take the shepherd role in the church now, whilst just overlooking Peter, who's messed things up so badly. But Jesus didn't. He didn't do that, did he? He took Peter through this realisation of his sin, of this repentance, of this reconciliation and restoration, because Jesus wanted to show that he can use the broken for his kingdom. And we must be broken, or we'll never know the fullness of being in Jesus. And once you know how much God has forgiven you, you'll truly be able to forgive others. And where we might never trust Peter again, that's what we would do, and say, we, you, you've let us down, you've let me down. The Lord Jesus doesn't simply bring him back even to where he was, but he gives Peter new challenge and new responsibility. And that's why he says this, feed my lambs. Of course, lambs are, are young, aren't they? They're the young, and in some ways, of course, the church is just about to be born, you know, the day of Pentecost. And their lambs, they'd be young in the faith. Feed my lambs. And then as it goes on, take care of my sheep. Why? Well, because just like in the, in the real world with sheep, what are out there as well as the sheep? There are dangerous things like wolves. There are, there are perhaps sheer drops to fall down. There are lots of different things that you have to watch out for. Don't eat that. Come over here. This is safe pasture. And so he must say, take care of the sheep. And of course, I've just used a, a literal, you know, woolly sheep illustration. But as we've been looking through um, different letters in the, old, in the New Testament, such as 1 Peter, and 1 Timothy, and, and, uh, and 2 Timothy, and, and Titus, 
we've seen it's so important to get things right, to guide people in the right way. And Peter is being given this job. Feed my sheep as well. So important that our minds are fed on what is good and wholesome for us. Jesus is sending Peter to both evangelise people and to pastor, minister to churches. Well, what does all this say of the Lord Jesus Christ? It says that he truly is the God of the second chance. Yeah, because he knows how weak and sinful we are. He's a forgiving God. You know, people outside of the church often think that God is just waiting to punish us, jump on our sins. And yet it is our responsibility as Christians to show the fullness of God's attributes. Yes, he is a holy God who's angry at our sin, but he is a loving God who wants to be united with his people. His love and his forgiveness are shown to the repentant. Just as he is committed to us, we need to be committed to him. It's as though after we've admitted to him that we've done the wrong and in our thinking, in our speech, in our actions, that Jesus asks us, do you truly love me in that way that Jesus asked Peter that day, do you truly love me? He asks us, do you truly love me? Because we each need a, a living and a dynamic and growing relationship with him, which starts when you see Christ on the cross, taking the punishment that we deserve, you deserve, for your rebellion to his rule in your life. And his sacrifice can set us free from the burden of all our sin and bring us into his presence and his power. It doesn't take us away from this life, of course. We'll still have the same relations. We'll still have the same colleagues. We'll still have the same neighbours. But we'll have somebody within us who is completely new to us, the presence of the living God within us. Jesus loves, Jesus forgives, and he seeks not to punish us, but rather to rebuild us and restore us. Someone's told an, an imaginary story about a man who's stolen money from the till at his employer's department store. And later his conscience troubles him to the extent that he goes to his employer and he admits the crime and he hands the money back. And his employer says, I forgive you. This time, I won't call the police. But you're fired. Mm. And the man could understand what his employers had done. And he could think that he's got off quite lightly. Because he hasn't got a criminal record. But suppose instead the employer says, well, yes, I forgive you. I will not hide my disappointment in you or the hurt that I'm feeling because you betrayed my trust, but I forgive you. And to demonstrate that, I'm putting you in charge of the whole of the finances of the store. Whoa. And the question is, does the man doubt his employer's forgiveness is genuine? No, of course not. And this should spur him on to greater loyalty. He would, he would you know, work to his, you know, for all his life, I'm sure, for a man like that. And this is how Jesus will treat every one of us who seeks true discipleship today. You see, he doesn't say, never mind, everyone messes up, just forget it, move on, do your best. No, we come to him knowing that it was for our sins that he died. And we confess our sins to him, taking that precious promise in 1 John 1 verse 9. 
that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, yeah, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And know that he wants us to be his disciples who know that repentance and that reconciliation and that restoration that only come from being real with Jesus. You know, we might not be meeting Jesus on a beach after Jesus has just cooked fish for us. But nevertheless, it's the same creator God who made all those fish. The God of miracles. Yeah. And it might sound exciting and perhaps sensational to read of such things. But the most precious thing here isn't the 153 large fish. Well, that's good. and It shows how powerful Jesus is. But the most precious thing here is a relationship restored. And that's what God is in the business of, restoring people to himself. And I hope you understand that, that includes you, that we all need to get right with God and move on with him, continuing, growing in love for him. Let's pray together. Father God, we praise you uh, for your love shown to us in so many different ways. And in the most basic way, even if we're not named in the Bible in the way that Peter is, we know that we are invited to join you. We are invited to know you personally to have your power within us to have you deal with our sin to have you take away our guilt and shame and to know peace and forgiveness in their place thank you lord uh, for your work in us and we pray again for any who do not yet know this that they will hear your call and see in you the wonderful God that you are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.